going back to the uh, drug war a little bit, I'm kind of curious as to like, you know, how much can the Mexican state like actually do while, you know, this has never been like explicitly acknowledged by uh, the U.S. security state, but it's more or less obvious that they do kind of like play favorites and like will pick like a favored cartel for like a five year period. You know, they'll decide that just for stability's sake, supposedly that it's better for, you know, one or two cartels to be dominant over the rest and just um, whatever weird deep state shenanigans are going on there. Like how much, you know, I don't think that like the Mexican state can do nothing, but it does seem like they're kind of limited in, you know, what you can actually do there. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, the Sicario thesis, I guess, is right in that regard, right? Like we, this is a long history of the the whole, you know, that one of the main uh, strategies that the U.S. government has used against uh, narco trafficking organizations is, is to play favorites, right? And is to work, collaborate secretly with like drunk kingpins so they can turn over rivals or even allies, and that just it creates havoc within these organizations, a fragment, and then that leads to like massive amounts of violence at the local level. There's a great book by, by my friend Ben Smith called The Dope. It's a history of the Mexican drug trade. And one of the things that Ben talks about in that book is that, you know, this, this business began from within the confines of the Mexican state. Um, and it, it began within the, the confines of the Mexican military, Mexican political police. And, and really, by the time you get to the 90s, it kind of is like Frankenstein's monster, right? Like it kind of got beyond their control. Uh, particularly fueled by these incredible levels of profit brought by the, by cocaine. Yeah. So one of the, to answer your question, Felix, to, one of the things that the Mexican state could do is to look internally within its different agencies and security apparatuses and to identify which groups and individuals play an active role in fostering and fostering, collaborating and allowing the system to like function smoothly. But it, that only gets us to half of the story because none of this is ever going to change without the U S whether it's addressing why Americans want drugs or whether it's addressing how the DEA, the CIA or other paramilitary organizations are also secretly fomenting or involved in, in this drug trade, like we're not going to get anything done. So the Mexican state can do things like, I mean, I think the, the, the way that, that Lamlo talked about this in 2018 when he was in, with campaigning was to legalize drugs. Yeah. Um, and that, there was very limited, uh, very limited decriminalization of drugs. Um, there was also plans to when people were still producing and growing opium and opium puppies, there was a, an idea. Why don't we create like a national pharmaceutical state owned company where we have these peasants grow opium puppies, sell it to us. And then we use that to pr to produce our own opiates, which you can imagine there's a certain uh, industrial manufacturing sector in the U.S. that would really hate that um, yeah. that idea. <laughs> yeah. Right. So but at the very least, it could identify like which like. You, we, they know which like high ranking military officers are involved in, in the drug trade. They know which, who's doing what at the local level and they use them. That's the thing. In certain localities in the countryside, in the rural sectors, they know which military units or national guard units are working with local narcos to take out other local narcos. It's a form of like state making on the cheap instead of actually you know, sending more state resources to, to build schools, to build medical clinics, to build roads, stuff like that. So it's, it's a really complicated story, but there, there is stuff they can do, but they are limited. And, and for me, the limitation has to do with the role that the U.S. plays in this on a variety of levels. Yeah, I mean, like, it's sort of the same playbook you see both, you know, by Mexican authorities and to a larger extent, American authorities, the same playbook that you see you know, like in Syria or Libya or wherever, just that like your, your, your policy goal is to have as many disparate groups competing as possible. And it creates an environment where you are absolutely necessary. And like you said, they can, you can make those people fulfill the functions of state on the cheap. It's sort of like the Uberization of proxy groups. And it, you know, it just at the end of the day, no one is going to voluntarily stop participating in like a trillion dollar market, whether it's actual drug traffickers or, you know, intelligence agencies who, you, you know, this, what a great way to get off the books money this yeah. is. Yeah, totally. And it's, they've been doing this for decades, right? Like if you look at like the history of the Italian mafia and, and 
how they were working with them to control New York City docks during World War II or to work with the Corsicans to control Marseille's ports during World War II. It's interesting when they start to identify enemy regimes as, as like narco states, because that gives you an idea of like a preview of like how the U.S. state is reading kind of like the geog- their geopolitical ideas. So like there's been a, a lot of stuff coming out recently about Syria being like the new narco state, like the Captagon. Cap- What's that drug called? Captagon, I think. Yeah, Captagon, which is yeah. Like- Captagon is like weaker than Vivans. They make it sound like it's fucking V from the boys. Yeah. Like you can just <laughs> yeah, take no. it and kill like 50 Delta Force guys. You're like, okay, maybe you could write an essay better on it. Well, that's what's fueling Hezbollah fighters, apparently, according to the yeah. Wall Street Journal. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, yeah, the war on drugs is just another way to extend uh, U.S. empire. And this has been the case, particularly since the end of World War II. And, um, there's just numerous examples of of the U.S. working with the regimes that it identifies as like allies who are actually involved in narco trafficking and then identifying enemy regimes who they want to take out and then accusing them of being like the biggest narco states on the planet. Another message to the criminal cartels in Mexico. You smuggle enough fentanyl across this country to kill 148,000 young Americans. You have killed more Americans than every terrorist organization in the world combined. And that's when President Trump gets back in office. He's going to designate you a terrorist organization, and he's going to wipe you off the face of the earth. You're done. You're done. I mean, talk about uh, the war on drugs and expanding U.S. empire. Well, I mean, just this past week, we maybe have a preview of things to come with uh, the Trump's new border czar for when he takes over in January has said in media uh, statements that uh, that we're going to, quote, wipe out the cartels and the narco traffickers. And we're going to deploy a U.S. special forces into Mexico to, to quote, take out the cartels. So, Alex, given the given the, the possibility, you know, a small possibility of an actual war between the United States and Mexico, who, who do you got? Who's winning? Because no. I got to say, yeah. if the U.S. Special Forces face off against the cartels, I think that would be the first time in a long time they'd be fighting someone who probably has better guns than they do. Jeez. Thanks to the U.S. gun industry. Thanks to Eric Holder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, fast, no, like, furious. Too fast. Too furious. What's that guy's name? Homan? I mean, he was like an Obama appointee. <laughs> like he, this, yeah. this animal like got his start in like the Department of Homeland. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, yeah. Thanks yeah, to yeah, Obama, Obama was right? the first person to appoint him. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't. This is so. I mean, I blame Taylor Sheridan for all this, but um, <laughs> he has to answer for a it's lot. His, it's his fucking fault, man. Stay out of the border, you asshole. Just continue doing Yellowstone. Um, go to the different border. Stay up in go Wyoming. Different borders. Yeah, get up there. No, this would be this would be catastrophic. Um, and I, and, you know, we have like a Florida man foreign policy that's going to emerge thanks to like Marco Rubio, Michael Waltz, who's another one of these insane people talking about launching missiles and special forces into Mexico. Um, you know, Florida has a very particular special idiosyncratic anti-communist political culture for a variety of historical reasons, but that's called the, the Latino that, vote in this country. That's the Latinx <laughs> vote. Um, and get it right. Will. actually Felix needs to apologize for inventing the term Latinx. I um, thought it causing, was helping. Yeah. <laughs> I We're going to start getting like gex. It. That's what I'm going to start referring to it. Um, <laughs> well, Matt, Matt kept referring to it as Latinx. So I blame Latinx. him. <laughs> that is how I always read it. You know, yeah, when, my head. when it first started being used in the U.S., I used it in like a department email that I used that I knew would confuse a bunch of my older colleagues. It was kind of amazing. They were like, what? <laughs> this is like 2016. They were so confused as what Latinx pertained to. It's one of my finest moments as a colleague. Anyway, um, it would be catastrophic. And one of the things we know is that whenever the Mexican army, who is like highly trained, you know, um, capable in terms of maintaining inter- quote unquote internal political stability, anytime they face off with, with like with these narcos, it's, it's a bloodbath on the narco side. Um, and it because it's like uh, most of the time, it's like these young men with limited p- military training facing off against a powerful military. So anytime we hear this talk about Mexico's a failed state and all that's bullshit. But if if this were to happen, it would just be catastrophic just in terms of the mass displacement of people that this would create and guess where these Mexicans who are displaced are going to come, right? Like this is one of the things that I worry about Marco Rubio in charge of policy toward Latin America is that they're going to offer the very same policies that are going to generate the things they say that they're opposed, whether they do regime change efforts in Cuba or Venezuela, it's going to massively displace people. And where are these people going to come from? They're going to, they're going to come to the U S Mexico border 
And that's just, it's going to be this weird um, circle that they can continuously use to justify their, their, their brutal pol imperial policies against Latin America. Um, the thing that worries me about U.S. and Mexico, though, and these threats that, that the U.S. will invade Mexico or U.S. use special forces to take out drug cartels is that the, the ground has been prepared for this for a while. Right. You, the whole talk of a, Mexico as a failed state began during the Obama administration. And we've had now almost 15 years of talk of that sepia filter that that looks at Mexico as a narco state, failed state. And now you add the political element. They don't like the, the parties and the party in power, even though this party is collaborating with you on, on several important issues like that does worry me um, that this is a possibility. And we'll see. I don't know. Um, yeah, well, not, I, it wouldn't be the first time the U.S. has invaded Mexico <laughs> before, and it's never been a good thing. So, 